This is the day that the Lord has made. All right. Amen. Let's now uh, settle down and get settled in our seats and uh, open our minds and hearts to prepare for worship with our prelude. Welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church on this beautiful and warm February morning. We are so blessed in so many ways. We are blessed to be able to come back and worship together in person. We are blessed for the ways that God is working in our church. We are blessed for the ways that God is working in our nation, in our community. God is working in so many wonderful ways, so many powerful ways among us. Now, do you believe it? Yeah. Oh, let's hear. Come on. That's, yeah, yes. God is working. God is working. God is making the world a better place 
things have changed and things are changing. And, and, and with every year, with every day, the kingdom of God draws closer. The kingdom of God draws nearer within us and among us and makes the world a better place. If you're having trouble believing that, you've come to the right place. Because we're, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about how the good news of Jesus Christ has transformed and is transforming the world, bringing the kingdom of God ever more present among us. So we are blessed. And we are blessed to see you all here this morning. My name is Jason Thornton. I'm the senior pastor here. I serve alongside Pastor Lisa Brown. And um, let's now join together in our opening prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light, may we see life clearly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you all to stand as we join together in our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfolds like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Love divine is reigning o'er us, binding all within its span. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. It is so good to be with all of you this morning. I invite you to prepare yourself for our morning prayers, the prayers of the people where we come before God with the prayers of our individual lives, but also our collective prayers. So I want to just take a moment of silence for all of us to just think about um, how you were feeling before you walked in through that door this morning, before you walked into the sanctuary. Some of you may have left home this morning with deep concerns in your heart. Maybe some of you just weren't feeling quite well and weren't sure if you're going to make it to church or not, but you're here. Um, some of you drove here and some of you walked here, and we are, we're just glad that you're with us. So let's take just a, a few moments to center our hearts, center our minds, center our bodies as we come before God with our prayers today. Let us begin. O 
Oh, God, you are over all. You are in all, and you are beyond all. Open our eyes to see the wonders that surround us. Open our hearts to know the wonders of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our brothers and sisters of different faith traditions around the world. Open our lips to sing your praise. O oh God, restore all people in your image and likeness. In Christ's name, we lift up this morning friends and family that are a part of this faith community. We lift up prayers this morning that extend beyond this community of St. Paul's. O oh God, we come before you with our prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude. We give you thanks and, and praise this morning for new beginnings and new opportunities. We give you thanks and praise for Kim Borges, for her faithful service here at St. Paul's for 13 years. And God, we continue to lift up Kim and Wayne and their family as Kim begins a new employment opportunity. And so, God, we lift them up to you. Lord, in your love and mercy. God, we lift up to you those that we know who are having birthdays this coming week. We lift up Don and Randy. We lift lift up Jean and Charlie, Jonathan and Caitlin, Evelyn, Bob, and Greg. And God, we lift up to you all of our families and friends who are having birthdays this coming week because we know that each and every day, each life is a gift from you. And so we celebrate that. Lord, in your love and mercy. And God, we, we believe that you know our prayers even before we ask them. But to stay connected to you and being in relationship to one another, we lift up those to you who have some concerns some worries, some health concerns in their lives. Those who are recovering from surgeries, those who are healing from sickness, those who are recovering from injuries, those who are currently in the hospital, or those who are recovering at home. O oh God, we lift up to you this morning Kim's mother, Paulette Evans. Lord, in your love and mercy. We continue to pray for Garen Janilla, who is now home after being in ICU in Reno. And we continue to pray for his recovery. Lord, in your love and mercy. God, we continue to pray for Amy and Tammy, who continue to recover and gain strength from their recent procedures. Lord, in your love and mercy. We lift up on this day Mrs. Jean Inerarity, who continues to heal at home 
And we lift up Mr. Jean in a rarity as he provides care for her, and we pray for their family. Lord, in your love and mercy, we pray for Noel and Leoma. We are grateful that they have time away this weekend with their family, a time of rest and respite. Lord, in your love and mercy, And God, we lift up to you Jean Murchie as she is um, undergoing some medical tests. And so we lift her up to your care today and in the days ahead. Lord, in your love and mercy. And God, we continue to pray for Sue Benicki, the pain that she has in her back and the difficulty she has in walking. Heal her. May she continue to recover and gain strength. Lord, in your love and mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, it is in your love and in your mercy that we lift up all of these people to you. Those that we have prayed for here today in this sanctuary but also all of those prayers that remain in our hearts, all of those people that go unnamed, but you know them. We lift all of them up to you, O oh God. And so as your people here on earth, as your people who are a part of this kingdom on earth, we pray together in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's now take a listen to Celebrate Wonder. Greetings, I'm Carly. Isn't it amazing that God gave us so much to wonder about? From the tiny cells in our bodies to the biggest galaxies, to all the different animals and plants in our world, to our own awesome bodies. Every day, there's something new to discover if we just look around. To be honest, I can be so focused on what I have to do that I miss out on enjoying the wonder of God. Sometimes, when I'm running from school to practice and back home again, I forget how amazing it is that my body can do all the things that it can do even when it's not perfect. It can be easy to miss things when we are so busy or focused on something else. In our Bible story today, the Pharisees missed an opportunity to experience the wonder of God. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and there was a man who couldn't fully use his hand. One of the rules of faith was to not work on the Sabbath, which was a holy day of rest. The Pharisees were watching to see if Jesus would follow the rules or break the rules and heal the man. Jesus decided that he would heal the man's hand because this was more important. His hand was healed right in front of their eyes. A miracle, that's amazing. Instead of celebrating and enjoying the wonder of the moment, the Pharisees focused on the rules. They were mad that Jesus had worked on the Sabbath, even though he had done something out of love. Can you imagine seeing something so amazing but only being able to focus on a rule? This story reminds me to take time to wonder about God. Next time I'm in the car, I won't just be frustrated because we aren't where I want to go yet. I'm going to marvel at God's creation out the window, look at my sibling sitting next to me, and remind myself how cool it is that I can feel the wind on my face. When we practice wonder, we won't miss moments like the Pharisees did. 
Sometimes we are focused so much on our own agenda that we miss the miracles of God. Take some time to wonder today. Don't miss out on all the awesome things around you. Now it's time for you to wonder. Many healing stories from Jesus' life and ministry are challenging from a modern medical point of view. In today's story, what does it mean that the man had a withered hand? Some believe that the man had some form of paralysis or arthritis in his hand. It may have been a lifelong ailment. We know that Jesus healed those who were suffering for many years. The man in today's story probably needed accommodations to be a part of the community. Maybe he couldn't do the kind of work that he wanted to do. Or maybe people looked at him strangely or felt sorry for him. Jesus wanted him to be a full member of the community. Those with illnesses or disabilities were marginalized by the society in which Jesus lived and worked. Many still feel that this is true today. I encourage you to pray for those that need healing and look for ways that you can help those in need. Please pray with me. God of community, help us to find ways to love and include everyone. Help us to notice who is missing and do our best to include them, just like Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Have a good week, everybody. Okay, now is the time in our worship service where we lift up the ministries and events of St. Paul's for your prayers and for God's blessing. And today, uh, we have a lot of great things going on because we are uh, opening uh, our small groups back up to meeting in person. So this week, we're going to be having Coffee, Tea, and a Prayer on Mondays at 11 to 1. Or Tuesdays, we're having our Centering Prayer group, that which starts at 6 p.m. in the Fireside Room. Uh, disciple classes are starting again on Wednesdays from 4 to 6 and Thursdays from 6 to 8. Our Alzheimer's group is meeting again on Thursdays in the fireside room at noon. We have a lot of other ministries that are opening up. I encourage you to take a look in your, uh, your weekly newsletter to uh, look and see what other opportunities you have uh, in our ministries and events. Um, but right now, uh, today we are uh, giving thanks to our beloved Kim Borges and uh, celebrating the new opportunity that she has. And so at this time, I invite Kim and her husband Wayne to come up front. So, um, Kim, uh, you have been with us for 13 years, and uh, we have grown to love you, and, and this is very hard. Um, this time, um, saying goodbye, uh, but we want to send you into your new job with our blessing we want you to know that we are with you in love and um, you will always uh, be special and treasured in our congregation. So uh, Pastor Lisa has a present that from us for you and Wayne. And uh, it's, do you wanna talk about it, Pastor Lisa? Sure. So in this uh, envelope, there's a, uh, a gift card 
to Wine and Roses in Lodi. And I know you're both fond of Lodi. Um, so Kim, you can decide. Either you could take that gift card and do a spa day and treat yourself or you can go and have a nice dinner, the two of you, or however you want to spend it. Um, the gift card is on its way, so as soon as I receive it, I'll make sure you get it. <laughs> but um, it's a way for us to say thank you, um, just a, a token of our appreciation for your, for your years of service. Um, you know, I hope all of you had the chance to read Kim's letter on Friday, and um, the word that stuck out or spoke to me was witnessed. What she witnessed here in 13 years. Um, so, I know Kim uh, has journeyed with all of us, um, celebrations, new lives, marriages, um, deaths in our families, um, people moving away, new people arriving into this congregation. I know that um, she's been with me through some difficult time, um, and I'm grateful. So, Pastor Jason and I, we give thanks to your entire family, because you have been a faithful servant of Christ here in this place, and so we want to offer you a blessing um, as you move on, as you move forward, as you move forward with a great opportunity, um, but you will always have a special place in our hearts and in our lives, and um, we are deeply grateful. Yeah, so. Okay, everybody, let's join together in prayer and offer Kim our blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many years that you have given us with Kim. Now that she has this new opportunity at the San Joaquin County Office of Education, we pray that you bless this time, this transition, that you make this new job uh, a huge blessing for her and her family. Lord, most of all, we pray that you help her to feel your presence walking with her every step of the way and to feel our love. And Lord, we just pray that, that, um, that this new opportunity brings a new time of prosperity and joy to their home. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's to honor Kim after worship. So hopefully those you can stay and enjoy a time of uh, celebrating there as well. For, so for our children, it's time for us to leave. Thank you. Now we have our time of uh, special music and during our special music, the ushers will be bringing the plates down the aisles. Uh, if you have any offering that you would like to uh, have us place on the altar, now's the time to uh, to turn it in and uh, but so now let's enjoy our special music faithful by uh, jay genie and ann talcott Thank you. <laughs>
Please pray with me. Gracious God, you have given us so much. You have given us so many blessings in our lives. The biggest blessing of all, Lord, is you have given us the opportunity through our lives to spread your goodness among people and in the world and to be a part of your power and your spirit in making this world a better place.
in gratitude for this opportunity and all you have given us. We offer you this morning our wealth, our prayers, our song. Lord, we offer you our lives. We pray that you take our offering and sanctify it, that you take our offering and continue to use us to be that beacon of hope in our community, that place of love and healing, which is your kingdom. We pray all this in the name of our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Now we have our scripture reading this morning, uh, done by Margie J. As we continue in worship, we invite you to hear these words of scripture from Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And saying, the time was fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of today's scripture to take into the world. Amen. Well, every time I, I lead a Bible study in the Old Testament, I'm, I'm excited because I love the Old Testament. <laughs> and, uh, but every time the, the class is amazed at both how strange the stories of the Bible can be. And at the same time, how human behavior is also very familiar. And they look at the stories that went on thousands of years ago that we are told through the scriptures, and they see that, that really in many ways, human behavior has not changed over the centuries. In the pages of the Old Testament, we find people who are dissatisfied with life, people who are unfaithful and adulterous, people who are envious and greedy, people who are manipulative, lustful, hate-filled, violent, cruel, and on and on and on. In the pages of the Bible, we read how human beings rape and murder and wage wars against their enemies, brutally killing men, women, and children, and we are horrified at the violence. And so often I hear the lament, oh, it's so sad, people haven't changed at all. It's so sad, nothing has changed. And I know that some people come away from reading the Old Testament wondering, has Jesus made a difference in the world? The world is still a corrupt and cruel and violent place. What good is religion? And very sadly, some people give up and walk away. Well, on one hand, they're right. Human beings are certainly still able to be unfaithful and adulterous and corrupt and hate-filled and violent and cruel. All you have to do is turn on the news, and we see it all. Humanity is still prone to great sin. That is a truth. And yet, this idea that humanity has not changed, that nothing has changed, is completely wrong. Humanity and the world have changed so dramatically and so deeply that it's impossible for us to even see the changes. Because the changes have become so normal to us. We live in a completely different world than the world Jesus lived in. And all of the changes that we have experienced over the last 2,000, well, yeah, 2,000 years can be traced directly back to Jesus. The first major change that I need to point out is that we are actually horrified by the violence in the Old Testament. 
That's a huge change to an ancient Greek or Roman or even a Hebrew. The violence in the Old Testament would have been seen as a very normal way of conducting business. You know, I have to say, we, we experienced the, uh, the riots of last year. You know, whether it was the riots in the summer um, surrounding uh, the BLM or whether it was the riot on January 6th. We experienced those riots and people were arrested and many people are on trial right now. But you know, you know what would have happened in ancient Rome? In ancient Rome, you would have seen the roadways lined up with the rioters hanging on crucifixes. Brothers and sisters, we have changed. In fact, to an average Roman, the stories of how, how God commanded the Israelites to kill every man, woman, and child as they invaded Canaan, you know, that, that, that fact that really horrifies us, an ancient Greek or, or a Roman would have thought that that made good sense. Just kill them all. Then you don't have to worry about anything in the end. You know, you don't have to worry about any people coming back and rebelling. In fact, in fact they would have applauded this way of conducting war as a virtuous way of conducting war. You see, for the Greeks and Romans, the highest virtue was to love your friends and hate your enemies. They felt hating your enemies was a virtue. And the more you hated your enemy, the more virtuous you were. To do good for your friends and to give evil to your enemies is what they strove to do at every possible opportunity. They did not understand what forgiveness is. They understood what vengeance was. It was Jesus who turned that ancient virtue of loving your friends and hating your enemies on its head by teaching us that not only must we love our friends, we must love our enemies. Now, I can imagine saying, well, Jason, yeah, but, but they killed women and children. That, that, and I have to say, killing women and children was totally normal. It's not normal for us, but it was totally normal for them. In fact, to ancient Romans and Greeks, the lives of women and children were often much less valuable than even the lives of their slaves. Because their, their slaves, that was part of their wealth, right? Slaves cost money. Women and children were expendable. That's the way that it was. It was Jesus. It was Jesus who, I might add, was standing directly in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets when he said, take care of the widows and orphans. It is Jesus that teaches us that women and children's lives are important. He taught us to take care of widows and orphans. Jesus gave value to the lives of women and children. It was Jesus who taught, remember, let the little children come to me. It was Jesus who taught that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like what? A child. To even enter the kingdom of God, we must become like a child. So the value of a child, he took and took from the very bottom level of society and placed it at the top. Jesus turned it all upside down. It was in the early church that we hear of in the book of Acts that actually created a social system of deacons to care for the widows and orphans. 
to collect money from the church and then take that money and care for the widows and orphans. That was the, 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 this, this uh, organization that we hear about in the book of Acts was the first social welfare organization where people gathered together for the purpose of raising money to take care of women and children. And here we come to another major innovation that Christians have made in the world. In the ancient world, there were no public hospitals. There were military hospitals. And there were hospitals that treated gladiators and valuable slaves. But those who were injured or sick, they did not have a hospital to go to. The best they could do was they would go to the temple of Asclepius, who was the god of healing, where they could pray and they could seek a vision at the temple for how to treat their ailment. Now, if they had enough money, they could probably hire a priest who would do some kind of treatment for them. But the poor were totally out of luck. It was Christians who invented the public hospital where everybody could go to find treatment for their injury or disease. After Constantine, the Emperor Constantine declared in the Edict of Milan that Christianity was an official accepted religion in the Roman Empire. This happened in the year 325. After that, it was decreed that public hospitals would be established in every city that had a cathedral. In other, word, in, in other words, in every city that had a church, they would establish a hospital. And then the Christians of that town would raise the money and fund that hospital. And these were hospitals where even the poor could find treatment. Well, the ancient Greeks and Romans really didn't have much compassion for the poor at all. Uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans, they lived by the idea of fate. So they, they believed that a rich person was rich because it was their fate. And a poor person was poor because it was their fate. Therefore, they often concluded that a rich person deserved respect and honor because they had been placed in that position by the gods. So a rich person deserved everything they had. And it followed that a poor person deserved everything they had. And as we show a rich person respect and honor, it's rightful to show a poor person disrespect and dishonor. That's the way they believed. <clears throat> it was Jesus who took his disciples into the temple and showed them the poor widow giving a tiny, tiny offering to the temple, the, the widow's might. It was Jesus who showed her to his disciples, and in showing her to his disciples, he shows her to us. And it is Jesus who teaches us that that woman, even though she is giving a tiny amount, is giving everything she has. And so she deserves our respect. She deserves our honor. Jesus taught, it was Jesus who taught us to honor the poor and the needy. And it was Paul who taught us that in the kingdom of God, there is neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, neither Greek nor Hebrew, because all are equal in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, everybody is equally loved, equally respected, and equally honored. These values taught by Jesus and spread by Paul have been passed down through the church for hundreds of years. These values of equality, of kindness, of mutual respect and honor, these are the foundations of our society. Now, I've been mostly focusing on how Jesus and Paul 
and the growing church changed the values and practices within Greece and Rome. Greece and Rome were the most advanced civilized cultures in the ancient world, but there were many more cultures beyond the boundaries of civilization which the church would eventually reach through their missions and through the missions of the church that the church would send into the world, the Christian church would change the values of all bunches of societies, bunches of cultures. They would change their values greatly. Many ancient cultures all across the world participated in some very evil practices. Many ancient cultures across the world participated in human sacrifice, child sacrifice. And the archaeological record is beginning to show that there were, there, that cannibalism was actually pretty widespread. Among the ancient cultures who participated in one or more of these ancient evil practices were the Canaanites. The Canaanites sacrificed humans and children. The Celtic tribes, the tribes that populated Gaul, which is now France, the, and then the British Isles, are, you know, the tribes that a lot of us are descended from, they practiced human sacrifice, maybe child sacrifice. There are stories about that. Also, the Teutonic tribes, the tribes that inhabited Germany and Scandinavia, which a lot of us are also descended from, they practiced human sacrifice and child sacrifice. Then there's the tribes in Polynesia, the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Incas of the Americas. All of these peoples practice those evil ways of worshiping their gods. Now, everywhere the Christian church established its missions and churches and colonies, the first thing it did was it forbade the practice of human sacrifice, it outlawed child sacrifice, and it banned cannibalism. Until today's, these practices, which were once, once considered normal for many of these cultures, have now completely ended. And we think about this, and it's almost too hard for us to think about that, that people actually did that. That has all ended for good. Finally, it was through the efforts of Christians in the British and American empires of the 19th and 20th centuries, it was through their efforts that slavery was finally ended. It began when the British Empire banned slavery, and it was through the lobby of Christians and their government that that came to happen. And then it spread to the United States with the abolitionists, and through a terrible, bloody civil war, we ended slavery. And then both the British Empire and the American Empire worked for 100 years to bring slavery to an end all across the globe. Anywhere where we had any political influence, we worked to end slavery. The last, it's my understanding, the last slave traded so bought and sold was actually somewhere in the Middle East. I don't remember off the top of my head, but in the 1960s. It took a long time, but we worked for it, and slavery has ended. And, and all of this change, the end of human sacrifice, the end of child sacrifice, the end of slavery, taking women and children and making them in e as equal importance to men in society, all of this, you know, um, all of this came about through the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the 
the work that Jesus accomplished in his life, through his suffering, by his death, and in his resurrection has changed and is changing and will continue to change us human beings from age to age. Now, all of those evil practices are ended. And now we uphold women and children as equal in importance. We've abolished slavery. And we, we are actually working to love each other better than at any time in the past. And as we continue to work to love each other better, the kingdom of God, we draw closer to the kingdom of God. Because that is the key to the kingdom. Love. Now, are we perfect? No. No, we are not perfect. We have much work to do. So, sisters and brothers, let's work together and heed the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who tells us the kingdom of God has come near. So therefore, repent. Let's turn away from sin. Let's turn away from our anger and our bitterness and our hatred and our violence and our lust. Let's turn away from our sin and let's turn to God and the love and the joy and the peace which God offers us. Let's repent and believe in the good news. Amen. Now, let's stand and join together in our final hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please receive this final blessing. Go forth from here to embrace the infinite love of God. May you feel God's forgiveness in your life. And may you feel the power of the Spirit so that your homes and your lives may be filled with love, with joy and peace. And take that love, joy, and peace with you into the world to share it with others. Go in peace. Amen.